hello everyone and welcome to today's uh, ISTVS Terra Mechanics Byte. Uh, our host for today is Dr. Sally Shoup, former president of ISTVS. So I'd like to welcome her to uh, introduce our guest as well as uh, continue the proceedings for the day. Thank you, Mohit. Um, you can hear me okay? Yes. Great. And welcome from a very beautiful sunny winter day in New Hampshire. Um, and it is really a great honor for me to be able to introduce Paul Ayers, who I met over 30 years ago, I believe, in Columbus, Ohio at a ASABE meeting. And we have continued our friendship and professional um, as professional colleagues over for over 30 years. So it's a real pleasure to introduce him today. Um, Paul Ayers is a biosystems engineering professor emeritus at the University of Tennessee. Um, he was, in my mind, really the first person to exploit the use of GPS in uh, application to vehicle and especially vehicle terrain interaction to explore georeferenced impacts on the terrain. Uh, very much ahead of his time at that time when GPSs were not widely used. Um, he also is uniquely skilled in his ability to generate methodical and quantitative frameworks for very complicated vehicle terrain interaction, especially if for vegetated terrain. So that's a, a, a real skill he has is to be able to put these things that people just look at and are very confused about into some kind of framework. Um, illustrating his deep understanding of vehicle terrain interaction is his talk today on the um, dynamic viscoelastic vehicle soil interaction model for rut depth, um, energy, and power. And um, wait, one more thing I wanted to say about Paul. Oh, from 2015 to 2020, he was the United States Secretary for the ISTVS, the International Society for Trained Vehicle Systems, and he was recently named an ISTVS Fellow. So thank you very much for agreeing to do this, Paul. We look forward to your talk. Great. Thank you very much, Sal. I really appreciate that introduction. Uh, it's been a, a pleasure working with ISTVS over the years and, and yourself and uh, working under your leadership uh, for the Americas. So let me um, work my magic here and see if I can get something to load. One more time. Jenna, you worked me through this a couple of times. I'm gonna go ahead and get this up and running. Hit that and share. How's that look? That looks great, Paul. Okay, okay, let's get back to the introduction. Sorry about that delay. Took me a little time to get moving there. <clears throat> So um, the talk today <clears throat> uh, comes from a STTR that I worked on with a, a number of people I'll talk about. <clears throat> Title is a little bit revised, development of a real-time physics-based dynamic viscoelastic plastic vehicle soil interaction model for rut depth energy and power determinations. Obviously, I'm going for the longest title possible, and I think I'm breaking the record with five hyphens in the title. So uh, you can fact check me on that, but um, let me know if that's a, a record or not. So this is an STTR that I worked on with a, a variety of other participants uh, years ago from 2010 to 2012. And we worked on this with, um, I worked on this as a sub project. Uh, my colleague was George Bosdeck, previously a graduate student at the University of Tennessee, uh, working now with uh, John Deere. And uh, George, you can correct me on any blunders that I make today. Uh, the One of the other colleagues, and, and so George and I worked on the soil model aspect of it. And so that's what I'm going to be presenting today. Uh, another participant was Jeff Freeman, who, who basically took the PI in the lead on this uh, with Mechanical Systems International. 
Unfortunately, Jeff is deceased, uh, but uh, Jeff worked on the, the tire model and the track model uh, for this. And two other participants uh, that uh, also subcontracted were Dan Negroot and Justin Madsen. Dan, of course, is the modeler at University of Wisconsin, doing some great work there uh, with DEMs. And, and Justin, I believe, was at University of Wisconsin. Last time I knew he was working with Oshkosh. So Dan and Justin were the ones that did the modeling aspect of it, taking my models and uh, uh, Jeff's model and putting that together, which you'll see some results later. Also, uh, the sponsors of this was U.S. Army Tardec, uh, Al Reed, uh, and uh, James O'Kins, who uh, participated uh, in this and provided some uh, advisory uh, status. So let's move on a little bit on the outline. I'll try to move quickly through this. I want to talk about tire and track placement and movement and stress distribution, the soil response, a little bit on the pedo transfer functions, and then briefly the model output and the energy and power calculations and mapping. All right. So first off, when we take a look at the the impact of a vehicle on the terrain, we got to figure out where it's hitting and what it's doing. And so we developed some models where we have a vehicle and then here are the two tires uh, that are impacting when the vehicle's turning. We can look at the placement of those tires and figure out here's the disturbed width, but the location of the tires as it's moving. And so we did some validation of that. I believe this is NUMA Proving Grounds, if I'm not mistaken, looking at tire placement with respect to turning radius and a little bit of rut depth types of measurements there. Also involved in the model was the, uh, the eight-wheeled striker that we worked with. The interesting part about the striker is that as it turns, the two front wheels will turn a little bit different angles. The, the back wheels are somewhat rigid, so somewhat are pulled along. And, um, and so we characterize the placement of the tire uh, with uh, these types of models. Also, feel free to interject in here. If, uh, if, if you have any questions during the presentation, uh, feel free to throw that in there, uh, interrupt me, and I'll try to address any questions on the go. The other aspect of the model dealt with tracked vehicles. And so this is my little schematic of a tracked vehicle with the tread width, and there's the turret and, and the gun support there. And so one of the analysis that I looked at for tracked vehicles as it moved is and turned was what does the track do? What does the track shoe do as it hits the ground and moves before it's lifted up? And so here, if you take a look at this turn, there's this, uh, the center of the turn, the track hits somewhat in the middle, depending on the turning radius. It slides to the inside of the turn and then to the outside of the turn. So anytime you're looking at a model to look at soil response, you really got to see what the heck is this tire doing? Is this really what happens in real life as the tire, as the track, sorry, hits the ground as the vehicle's turning? So got out there at Fort Riley, guy said he's going to do a donut. You can see the track here sliding towards me, actually sliding forward, and then sliding back the other way Keep sliding, keep sliding, and then lifts up. So if you're going to do a, a soil interaction model with a vehicle, you better know what the vehicle is doing to the soil. And so as you see, as it's sliding back and forth, in some of the analysis I did earlier in, in my career, we looked at the vegetation. But here we're looking at what is the, how does this impact the soil? Again, track hits the ground slides towards me, slides forward because it's the inside track. The outside track actually slips and then slides back the other way, forming a ridge, bulldozed, if you will, a pile of soil, et cetera. Okay, so we then went to, well, what kind of soil models are we going to look at here? And I love this quote uh, from George Box. Uh, essentially, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And this is so true when we're dealing with soil models. 
We're just trying to get the best guests out there. Now, George is a statistician, not necessarily a modeler, so he can approach it for, from that perspective, which is good. But we have to keep this always in our back pocket that, that all these models are wrong. We're just trying to make some useful. So I mentioned in one of my uh, earlier, I guess, the abstract or the title about NRMM and the next generation NRMM and how the material, even though this model, these models weren't developed for the next generation NRMM, they could be used. Some components of these models could be used. And I know there's the, the, the classical and the, and the theoretical aspect of NRMM. And so originally NRMM started with the wheel numeric, numerics down at West, developing dimensionless numbers, et cetera, and used that for track and wheel vehicles, horse and fine soils. And, uh, and and was used extensively. And those were good, relatively good models at that point. They were simple, they were easy to use, uh, and they did a pretty good job. Of course, now we're wanting to do something a little bit more detailed. Uh, and so some of the other uh, approaches are the Becker equation, I developed at Petardec uh, using round plates and, and uh, deformations. Also the FEM and DEM modeling uh, is appropriate. But we took a little bit of a different step, almost a civil engineering type of perspective in geo, uh, geotechnical engineering, where we're looking at stress distribution down into the subsoil, not just the surface loads, and also a compression index, and then adding other features. So we're, I'm going to talk mostly about that model, uh, the, the last one that's up here. So. What are the governing equations? Now, one of our uh, challenges was that we needed to develop a real-time model, something that could be calculated quickly, not a DEM or a finite element model that took hours and hours of computational time, but something that we could predict soft soil displacements uh, on the go as we're moving. So in that, we needed some deterministic equations and no iterations and, and, um, and that sort of thing. So we initially looked at using the theory of elasticity to look at the vertical stresses as a track or a wheel hits the, the soil and propagates the, the stresses down into the subsoil inducing um, compaction and soil movement. So we started off with the Boussinesq equation uh, using Froelich's concentration factors and Cerruti's uh, uh, modification of that or addition to that. And we'll get into a little bit of the weeds on that uh, a little bit later in the presentation. And so we're looking at the vertical stress and the horizontal stresses propagated down into the, into the subsoil. Then the, the concept is, well, what about the soil response? And so there's this, vertical viscoelastoplastic displacement of the soil, which takes uh, uh, looks at elastoplastic uh, deformations as well as uh, time and using the viscosity. And so that allows some for theoretically predicting multi-pass applications. And then of course, then there's the shearing of the turning. And then we've got uh, concepts of uh, shear deformation, slip sinkage uh, in the longitudinal direction, and uh, turning or lateral forces, and then the, the resulting bulldozing that may uh, come into play. So that's kind of the governing equations of this real-time soil model that uh, we implemented. So vertical stress using theory, uh, theory of elasticity. If you, this is the soil surface. If you apply a load P to the soil surface, you can go down into the substrate, uh, subsoil and look at the vertical stress that's applied down here. In addition, Cerruti looked at, well, what about horizontal stresses on the soil? And you can also calculate vertical and horizontal stresses uh, due to a horizontal load, maybe due to slippage or sliding of the track or whatever on the soil surface. <clears throat> so those are the, the fundamental theoretical approaches to subsurface soil stress uh, propagation. So Cerruti, um, I mean, so Froelich on the other hand, uh, well, Boussinesq developed that model for, for metals and Froelich took that 
and applied it to soils. And he looked at a variety of factors new uh, in this equation, four, five, and six, that dealt with uh, different strength levels of soils. And so we modif uh, the stress distribution is modified using Froelich concentration factors. This is not anything I developed. This is just pulled this out of the literature. So uh, Justice and Dan took this and, and developed a stress distribution model. And this is the model output from that. How do the stresses propagate down to the soil with different soil conditions? So that was kind of the first part. Then the, the thought would be, well, how does the soil respond to that? And so this is kind of a discussion about uh, soil response uh, using a compression index. Uh, this is similar to modulus elasticity with metals. It's a stress-strain relationship. Uh, we, it's influenced, obviously, by soil type and moisture. So you have to put those factors into this stress-strain relationship. Um, and it's time dependent. Let's see, time dependent, yeah. And there is and there is some sort of rebound. So you apply a load to the soil, it goes down, you get sinkage, and then as the load comes up, the soil rebounds, and that's your your resulting rut. So we tried to incorporate all that into the model. And um, let's see what I got here. Okay, good. And so this is a concept of here's my stress, here's my strain. Here's the elastic part, here's the plastic part, there's the rebound. And so it's all sort of an elastoplastic model that utilizes, um, well, this is the, the calculation. And so this is a, uh, Larson developed this 1980. This is a density model where the density starts here. You, uh, what, what's my final density? This is my original density. I've got a compression index, I've got applied stresses. Um, Sally, you'll appreciate this. And, and, and I have to look at my pre-consolidation stresses. Probably haven't heard that concept in a while. But I've got to look at my pre-consolidation stresses to see is that soil actually going to, density going to change with the applied load. Then if I look at this down here, the, the soil density row uh, is my initial one plus any change. And now I've got a time dependent factor here because it doesn't automatically change instantaneously. There is a uh, some time involved in this compression. Okay, and so I have a, a factor of tau and time in here uh, that utilizes a time constant uh, of soil compaction. And that's, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later. So the compression index, or essentially the modulus elasticity here, is, is somewhat of a function of clay content. Uh, the higher the clay content, uh, the, the more compressible, if you will, the soil is. And this, again, is from Larson taking his material and a lot of the, the developments that they did. So, again, we have bulk density of a soil particle due to applied stress. And now we've also got a function of moisture in there. So we have the soil type aspect as well as the moisture content influencing the final density of the soil, which of course, then you can relate back to displacement. Let's talk a little bit about time dependent sinkage. Of course, Becker looked at this uh, and, and it's in some of his references. And the uh, here's the time down here, here's the settlement. And you can see when you, after you apply a load, it takes a little bit of time for that load to settle out to, to the final uh, displacement. Uh, or, or settlement. So we nothing that we developed, we just pulled stuff out of, out of the literature that's ongoing. We did some, some uh, studies on uh, the influence of uh, different soil types on time, time dependent sinkage. So if we look at the dynamic model, of course you have a stress and a strain and then and it's over time. And then you have some kind of rebound when you take that stress out. I believe this is the Berger model uh, element here that uh, you can utilize. But the concept is elastoplastic, viscous, and then rebound uh, all come into play here. So a simple model, if you will, can utilize the... Um, bulk density versus time. If this is my applied stress, I don't know what that is, 200 and 
almost 290 uh, KPA applied to an element. This is all theoretical. It's not uh, data at this point. You you then have a uh, a sinkage or soil density uh, increase. That's soil density increasing, bulk density. And then as you take the load off, essentially it decreases and you have a little bit of time dependent uh, rise, if you will, and then your final um, your final density. <clears throat> so that's kind of the compression aspect of this model that we proposed and was implemented in the model. And then, then there's also, and I've done a lot of work on turning vehicles because the vehicle turns, it's going to cause a lot of damage uh, as different than, than going straight. And thus you have your lateral longitudinal stress strain relationships, Genosi Wong, uh, slip sinkage, if you will, uh, using uh, Saruti's uh, model that says horizontal on the a force on the surface is going to produce a uh, a vertical force and, and cause some sinkage. You can use that for your theoretical analysis. And then bulldozing uh, using, oh, another, another civil engineering aspect of passive lateral earth pressure, which I'll talk about a little bit detail here, I think. I'm watching the time. I think I'm doing okay. Uh, of course, this is the original, of course, similar equations of stresses and strains using uh, shear displacement, cohesion, friction angle, and shear deformation modulus. And so all of this can be put into the model to look at uh, the influence of shear on, on displacements. And the classic passive lateral earth pressure, where this is the soil surface here. You've got a, a, a force here pushing against the soil uh, element here that rises up. And uh, the, what is the force to, to sh create that shear, as well as what is the force to move that block of soil, to accelerate that block of soil, uh, F is equal to MA aspects. And so that you can put bulldozer types of uh, components into the model itself. Again, needing cohesion friction angle. We'll talk about pedo transfer functions and how to get those later. The other aspect of the soil and when we talk about bulldozing, and this is a, a schematic of a tire here that has some sinkage, and the question is, well, when does it start bulldozing, meaning pushing soil in front of it, and when does it just compact the soil? And, and that's a good question, and a lot of that is dependent on the, the sinkage of the tire, as well as at the bottom here, whether it's a brake tire, which is going to create more bulldozing, whether it's a free rolling tire and whether it's a drive wheel or it's actually got torque on it to pull that soil underneath it. And so different aspects of when does bulldozing start with the sinkage, the, the tire diameter and the characteristics of the, of the tire. Okay, so if we look at this and this is just some of the outputs of the model, the rut depth uh, when longitudinal bulldozing begins. So at some point we can predict based on the tire diameter and some characteristics of the soil, uh, when, at what depth do we start to see bulldozing as opposed to just the compression or the compaction of the soil as the tire is going over it. And that's a function of a variety of things. So we have to kind of figure out when bulldozing occurs before we start applying the bulldozing equation. And we use um, concepts here of this bulldozed wedge starting off at a certain location where that wedge is tangential to essentially the, the, the tire. And that's the start of bulldozing. All right, let's move on. Oh, here we got lateral forces. So as the track tire turns, as it's going straight, it's just compressing down into the soil. And you can see the track pad. This is an M1, third, M1 up at uh, Yakima Trading Center. But then as the tire, the track turns, you can start to see this sliding, as you saw in one of the, in the earlier video, the bulldozing over to the side as it occurs uh, due to the sinkage and the sliding and also on the inside. So of the, of the uh, I'll just throw a little more eye candy out there. Same thing. Uh, pack what we call pad scars, uh, where we see compression of, of a track vehicle, uh, which is really a multi pass if you consider the grousers' wheels. But then, as the device, as the track turns, the uh, bulldozing occurring uh, 
of the soil moving up. All right, it's enough of that. And, and similar with wheel vehicles. This is a striker at Fort Lewis. Uh, we're doing some spirals, mostly looking at vegetation uh, disruption, but the same concept is when a vehicle turns, you can see sideward pressures on the soil. It will uh, shear and move away and you can see the soil it be accelerated, which creates not only the deformation of the soil, but the energy and, oh, let's show that again, it's always good. The energy um, to dis uh, dislocate that soil and thus the power. And so there was an energy and a power aspect of this, of the model, which I'll get into in a little bit later. So there's the vehicle turning, wheels, some drive wheels, some wheels sinking and pushing soil out and bolts, lateral bulldozing, if you want to call it that. All right, so enough of that. So this is the concept of lateral bulldozing. This is the soil surface. You have some sort of sinkage initially. You have some depth here, and then you can calculate the forces to move that wedge and move that soil up and out. Oh boy, so now we've got lateral displacement in centimeters as a function of turning radius. Obviously, as you turn, the radius is smaller, you're turning sharper, and then also as a function of speed. And speed plays a critical component of this higher speed turns, gonna produce not only larger depths, but also uh, higher energies. And now if we take that and go back to energy, you can calculate the different turning radius at different speeds. What is the energy of that component of the turn? And there's this energy in joules versus turning radius. And then if you know also the energy and the speed, you can then convert this to power. And so essentially what is the power uh, to uh, work bulldoze that soil through that turn? Okay. Now, the model that we proposed and was implemented in, uh, um, in the project had a variety of factors that needed to be determined. Um, just can't use cone index, and uh, which is a problem with the, the newer models that needs you know, more information in order to, um, to drive some of the physics-based models. So we needed to calculate, determine compression index, rebound index, time constants, cohesion, friction angle, deformation, density, initial density, et cetera. And so we needed that. And so we needed to develop some pedo transfer functions from the information that we started with. Well, what did we start with? Well, this was sort of a description. This is Ethan Allen uh, database, uh, Sally, if, I'm not sure if you, have seen that or, or know about this, obviously, and you may have given this to me uh, to calculate, but the, um, the information that's given typically on a lot of these bases at the time we did this, which was 10 years ago, was relatively uh, small in terms of the uh, quantity of, of the data. We had soil type, MLCLs, the USCS classification for soils which then we also converted over to USDA classifications in order to use some of our pedo transfer functions. We also had moisture content and moisture content was not very specific, but was slippery, normal, dry, just kind of some qualitative factors there. And we did have cone index to start with, which is the rating cone index at different depths. So we kind of had that information, developed the pedo transfer functions for this. Thank you, George, for assisting with all that. Um, and um, so we were able to approximate, with this soil database that we had, we were able to approximate the uh, soil parameters that were needed in the model. So here's some output from uh, Justin and Dan's work at University of Wisconsin. This is the original soil surface up here. This would be the sinkage as it is, would have occurred when the, um, vehicle went over it and then this is the final rut depth or rebound characteristics of the soil. So we were able to take the governing equations that we had and Dan and, and Justin were able to put that into the model uh, for that the program. 
So as just an example here, I'm going to work my way through this a little bit. We had a, a, a clay loam soil. I think that's, you know, uh, it's 80 PSI, rating cone index, yeah, and uh, slippery moisture. And we looked at some soil elements, and we used a striker tire uh, traveling at a certain speed, certain inflation pressure. We'll talk about uh, surface loads and contact patches, if you will, uh, later on. Uh, we used... Uh, basically a, a uniformly loaded distributed rectangular surface load. Could have used something a little bit more specific, uh, but we are detailed, but we went with that originally. And so similar, we'd be able to calculate soil displacement in both the horizontal and the, the uh, vertical directions. Energy, you know, based, if we know the force and we know the displacement, boom, that's energy right there. So you can calculate the energy to basically compact that soil, if you will, and then utilize power from energy and time. Okay, so a little bit of a soil output here. This is the concept of, this is the uh, normal stress being applied as the tire went over an element. This would be the viscoelastoplastic deformation as it would have occurred, and then we have some sort of rebound, and we have some sort of soil density, uh, final soil density that occurred. Again, if we took four wheels going in a straight line, these would be the stresses, and this is just, uh, this is not measured data, this is um, just theoretical approaches uh, over time. Depending on the speed, it's going to be a little bit different. Now, here would be the bulk density. So we have the, the applied normal stress, and you have some sort of bulk density that occurs over a period of time using the time constant, some sort of rebound and settlement, and then this is basically your multipass function uh, using the time concept of uh, time dependency. There we go. Moving on. Uh, we can then take that density and then go back to soil vertical displacement of the element. So this would be centimeters. We said it was a one centimeter uh, block. And now here's our applied stresses. Here's our final displacements as the four wheels pass over. And the influence of moisture can be applied, sim similar block. Uh, uh, different moisture contents, different final densities uh, that apply to this. Of course, if the soil is already compacted to higher than 1.25 when we start or lower than 1.25, that will influence the final results, which includes your pre-consolidation stresses uh, of the soil. And then the influence of travel speed. If you go slower with the model, and this has been proven many times, you go slower, you're going to see more compaction. Uh, and the soil is going to be denser than if you go fast and giving it more time to compact. Of course, you can then take all the uh, forces and displacements, sum them together, calculate the model energy uh, to compact the soil as you move, and then the power output essentially for each of the tires as they go. That's where we get the energy and power output. Validation, thanks to George Mason, helped us out with some uh, coarse grain, some fine grain um, validation testing, utilizing his uh, uh, instrumented Humvee here. I'm not gonna get into the details of the validation. And then we applied this somewhat uh, to some striker tracking George and I did this, I think, out in uh, the Pohakaloa trading area in Hawaii on, a, on a, uh, maneuvers where we tracked some military vehicles and we um, calculated the energy, and actually the power, uh, mobility power, including a variety of aspects of the, um, uh, the, the whether you're going uphill, downhill, accelerate, accelerating, wind resistance and a variety of factors that went into uh, this mobility power. So how do I do on time? I think I'm okay here. Um, final slide, um, the questions that I have, uh, you know, feel free to, to add those in. Uh, uh, we uh, developed this model, not necessarily for mobility for the NG uh, NRMM. 
uh, does there's no slow go go um, types of uh, no go types of applications to this. All it is is what's the soil response to a surface load, and then of course we have all, all our disclaimers in there, which Department of Energy says that they don't believe anything I say, and it's the opinion of the author here to uh, um, uh, is is being presented. Um, so uh, this information was declassified, and um, so we're able to present that. And that basically sums up my presentation, Sally. Anything else I missed? Oh, that was very rich, Paul. There's a okay. lot of information in there. Um, we already have a few questions, mostly by George Mason, in the chat or the Q&A section. So if people can, while they populate those questions, I just want to ask a more general question. Um, related to your time constant, um, is it the same time factor that you use for the rebound as impacts the impacts of vehicle speed? And if so, how do you get that? Okay, uh, it is the, the time constant tau uh, does uh, is a similar is applied with the vehicle speed as well as the rebound, and mm -hmm. the tau factor was taken from a variety of studies that George uh, Bosdeck was able to find uh, that looked at uh, soil rebound um, uh, and, and compaction. And you saw the Becker data there. Uh, and so we pulled a variety of time constants out of that that's a function of not only the applied load, uh, but also uh, the soil moisture, I believe, um, and, and the soil type. So. So how do we find that? We basically went into the literature and found those time constants and applied those the best we could. Primarily from Becker. Uh, Becker started, if you noticed on the Becker slide, it was there was a Poppet ref reference. So I think he stole that from Becker. I mean, I think Becker <laughs> stole it from Poppet. So, uh, and then there's a variety of other time constants that uh, people have been using. Okay. And we measured and some ourselves. It was we had a high speed camera. We loaded some soil. We took the load off. We watched the the soil go up and down. It was pretty interesting experiments. All right, let's start working down some of George Mason's questions. Okay, <laughs> he's got a lot of them. Um, how first? How did you take your soils measurements? But I'm not sure which specific soil measurements he means. Right. So the soil measurements. You know, when I talked about the pedo transfer functions, and, and normally I'm out there doing cone index, drop cone, torsional shear, all those kinds of things. But for the model itself, when we're trying to predict what a vehicle is going to do, and we don't know what the soil is, we would go back to the database terrain characteristics that were available in, in the databases that we used. And it was mostly rating cone index, uh, soil moisture, and USCS classifications, um, and, a, and a couple other terrain factors. And Sally, you know this better than me. Um, and then we used pedo transfer functions the best we could to get cohesion, friction angle, things like that. So we didn't, didn't necessarily measure that for the model output. We used the existing terrain. Okay, and David White has a question and asks if you have compared your model predictions to DEM, which would be really interesting to see. Yes, that it goes. would be. <laughs> it would be. And I think the the thought would be I the the validation aspect of the analysis was passed on to Dan. And so the output of the models would come from Dan. And we haven't looked at validating necessarily a lot of the, the model output. As a matter of fact, I'm not even sure if this model is available. Uh, and we'd have you'd have to talk with Tardek about that. Uh, and when Jeff passed, I, I'm not exactly sure the the final output of the model in terms of its condition and uh, et cetera. But Dan Negrut would have much more information about any validation or or fi final model outputs and applications. Um, I do have to say that the model essentially was developed for a real-time simulator, and I think I can say this without getting shot, uh, for the joint light tactical vehicle, uh, JLTV, as it was being developed and tested with Tardec, and they needed a real-time soil uh, model with uh, power and energy calculations. 
All right, and Atham, Hatham El Zamor from Egypt has asked um, more about for more information about the validation performed with this model and the real experimental data. Yes, the validation basically, and and uh, I was done with George Mason out at, down in Vicksburg, Mississippi, uh, with a, um, a instrument in Humvee that he had put together down there, uh, torques, and we measured sinkages. Uh, and we basically did our tests in a sand, on a sandbar out in the middle of Mississippi, as I recall, uh, George, and also um, uh, in a, a, a field that has more clay soil in both, in both a dry and a wet condition. So that was the validation data that, that we collected. Um, and it asks, is this available for research purposes? Oh, the, is the NGNRMM available for research purposes? How do we get it? And can the software be used in an academic research? It's a long question, Center. <laughs> well, that's a really good question. I, I think, the, and I'm not one, and Sally's probably one to, to answer that first question, but my understanding is it's not, it, it's, it's really not a model. It's, it's sort of a certification of, of the model, uh, of different modeling approaches. And so it's not like overall deciding on one model. It's like these are models that can be used, uh, et cetera. The, the old NRMM, I'm not too sure if it's... Um, actually, actually uh, available for publication or use. I mean, you can go back and look at the papers and see the uh, dimensionless numbers and, and equations that were used in the development of NRMM and then go back to the cone index and the soil, the, the vehicle characteristics, and then go back to predict a, a go, no go, slow go. So all the equations for the original NRM, I believe are out there uh, the next generation one is not only still under development, as I understand, but isn't a single model. How's that it's, sound? Yeah, it's yes, it's really a set of standards to yes. drive the development and the existing framework for NGNRMM because um, there's many different software companies involved and some of it's proprietary, some of it's not. So it, sure. it kind of sets a standard for what's needed for the and GNRMM. I know David Gorsuch is on the line. I don't know if he wants to add to that at some point, but um, uh, we have about several more questions, though. Let's see. Yeah. Alex Keene, the Yuma test area looks quite dry oh, and granular. Really? So, say so, uh, so before oh, you ahead. do those, let's yep. bring on the couple of guests that we've got. Let okay. them ask their questions. Okay, Ray, great. Do you want to unmute and go ahead and ask your Dr. Ayers questions? Thanks. Hello, Dr. Ayers. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, I have two questions. So you were emphasizing a lot um, the compaction, um, you know, the vertical stress strain. But what about the the shear strain um, in your model? Does it use like a Janoshi Yan Anumatu type empirical um, fits that you use the pedo transfer equations to, you know, translate the older data to that? Or yeah, how does that work? the the shear specifically the shear yeah the, the shear aspect of it um utilizes that one the bulldozing equations that that we sh that i showed you earlier so you have a certain sinkage you have a certain movement of the track and thus you've got some forces to bulldoze the soil that's being moved um and so that's that aspect of, of the model and that's both for the wheeled and the tracked soil so the bulldozing aspect the other aspect of it deals with the the sh uh, de shear deformation and the shear stress applied so uh if you apply a shear stress you you'll get a shear def deformation and then again if you will if you all of us it's it's kind of like the chicken and the egg type of thing if the wheel displaces the soil then that produces some resisting shear within the soil and so you can go that route because a lot of times the the soil uh, the vehicle moves and the soil responds to the vehicle moving. Can I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah I think so. Uh, okay. But I, I I'll follow up on that. Is it theoretically calculated or empirically empirically driven? <laughs> well, there are no theoretical models. <laughs> First off, uh, everything is empirical. 
<laughs> so, yeah. You know, you look at your theory of elasticity and stress and strain. Well, modulus elasticity is an empirical measurement. Um, yeah. Now so gravity is an empirical, empirical measurement. <laughs> uh, density of air is an empirical measure. So, so there are no theoretical models. So let's just. Yeah, yeah but I, I meant like the Boz Bosonique uh, ones you showed earlier are more theoretical than, or uh, technically the empirical. Yes, yes, okay. they are. They're more theoretical, but then you start throwing in soil factors and, you know, uh, modifications and those sorts of things and everything. You know, you has it has an empirical flavor to it for sure. Okay, and so, then the so second. We, I'm going to start. I'm going to say you start off as theoretical as possible, and then you throw in the fewest empirical factors: cohesion, friction, angle. You know, those are all measured values, etc. Okay, and the second one was actually asked previously already, like. Um, you said it's a framework, um, and I've read a couple of the standards for the in next generation NRM, um, but it doesn't seem like uh, there is like the model that um, you know that is available or somewhere that we can implement. Uh, we have to develop it basically ourselves if we want to implement it. Or yes, I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, my component of the project was to apply the governing equations that go into the model. Uh, Dan and Justin were programming the model, and then it was turned over, in my understanding, over to TARDEC uh, for application. Now, where that is in the process and the available of, availability of that model, I'm not exactly sure. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Um, Jenna, I don't know if you can help David Gorsuch um, get online because he might have some comments on a couple of those things yeah. regarding where this stands with Tardic. Um, Sal, you might be able to help him. He needs to do the same thing that you did. He might need to uh, accept mic or camera access if this is a new computer. He's been on these our calls before. Boom, there he oh, is. I think he's coming in. Good. Okay. He's still yeah. muted, though. In the meantime, uh, Yue Wei Ma might have a question waiting in the queue. Well, we were going to do Alex's question. You want to do that one? Yeah, Alex Keene is online. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, hello, uh, Paul. Some interesting <laughs> ideas. And I think your comment about the theoretical to uh, empirical sounded fairly true to me as well. Um, the, uh, the the first one was I've, I've written it down, so I'll read it as I uh, as I put it there. Uh, the Yuma test area that you had at the beginning in one of your clips it looked quite dry and uh, probably quite granular. I don't know what sort of soil it was, but it looked a little bit like that. Um, how does moisture content affect your modelling um, if we're starting, for example, with a sort of fairly dry maybe solid state through to semi-solid plastic and liquid, how far down the scale of moisture content do you think you were able to go? Um, and how much scope is there to take that further? That was the, the first question. I was quite interested in that side of it. Sure. Well, let me try to answer a couple of those. Uh, yeah, Yuma was dry. It was hot, too. And uh, we picked that spot for that type of testing um, because the moisture uh, it was because it was dry, but we could also easily see the tire print of the soil. So then we were validating our tire placement models with turning radius. Uh, it was easy to see where the tire imprint was as a function of, of turning radius and to validate that portion of the model. In terms of the, how does the moisture content affect the modeling? Well, within the normal ranges of the soil, uh, the moisture content affects the compression index, uh, as uh, we laid out earlier, but also uh, affects his measurements of cohesion and friction angle. So, well, not, not friction angle, not as much, but, but cohesion, et cetera. And so as moisture affects the property, strength properties of the soil, then that affects the model. Uh, in, we didn't go to the point of liquidity or, you know, fluidized beds or anything like that where the soil starts to, quote, flow 
and act more as a liquid than a solid. Uh, we didn't get into that aspect uh, of the soil conditions, nor do we look at snow or any other sort of uh, terrain characteristics. Okay, thank you. Oh, so it's a still quite a long way to go over to difficult conditions. It's a sort of, sort of, would you say that sort of fairly early stage of the work you've got to and uh, uh, it needs to be taken further? Well, Alex, that's job security, buddy. So, yeah. you know, we're just, if we had solved this a long time ago, we wouldn't be having this, this yeah. group together. Uh, okay. So the answer is yes. Uh, okay. There's always more to learn. And what's encouraging is the NR, NG and RMM people are getting together. They're talking. They're sharing ideas. They're trying to find the best path forward. Uh, and, and that's really encouraging as opposed to everybody, you know, doing their own thing. Okay, and the second uh, question, I suppose, is a little bit more like uh, more job security. Have you transferred any of the modeling and the ideas to compaction and surface damage using agricultural tractors, tires and tracks at all? Well, to be honest with you, a lot of the compression index and models that were used were originally developed for agricultural soils to look at tractor rutting, et cetera. Um, the track vehicle turns at the end of the rows uh, definitely damage the soil. And when you go to Caterpillar and them and say, hey, look at what you're doing at the end of your alfalfa fields. And they say, well, you get a good rainfall, it'll all come back. Um, so the a lot of the Zuni, Zuni's model, a lot of the stress distribution, compaction, Larson, uh, Gupta Larson models, uh, Srini's work, uh, you know, that's a lot of that was for agricultural soils, yes. Okay, all right, thank you. So I'll leave you to uh, talk to David or to Yue. Sure. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Paul. You're welcome, Alex. Hi, just one short follow-up to that. Um, do you know if any, like the commercial vendors are using any the of uh, the work you developed in their NG NRMM attempts? I, I'm not sure of that. Um, I'm also not sure of, we did, we're, we were able to unclassify a lot of this and publish some papers um, in this, uh, but I'm not sure if the final reports have been unclassified and mm -hmm. whether that then can be used. So. Uh, you know, like I said, this was done 10 years ago when, and I've, I've uh, got calls and people have talked to me about the modeling itself and I've sent them the information that I have. Now, how much it's been used, I'm not exactly sure. Okay. And we heard back from David Gorsuch. He's having trouble um, on getting his mic to work. So he says free field. Feel free to email him. He's the chief scientist for what used to be TARDEC, was now GVSC, Ground Vehicle System Center. And um, he can talk more about that. In fact, maybe he should give a seminar on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there was a few more questions. Let's see. Uh, George Mason asked about some specific slides. Um, well, actually, actually, we have a guest online, Yume Ma. Yufei Ma? Yes. Oh, go ahead. Why don't you ask your question <laughs> yes. first? Um, yeah, basically, I missed the first part of presentation. <laughs> I forgot my schedule. Sorry. <laughs> but uh, thanks for your presentation. I enjoyed sure. the last part, which related to the validation. And uh, probably you talk about, I'm not sure about rolling resistance. And uh, since I missed the first part, and from the theory, I didn't see the um, constitutive equations. So how do you model this rolling resistance for different terrain materials, for example, snow, or sand, gravel, and those kind of things? Uh, is that a constant or how do you model that? What, I, I missed the, the critical part of that. What, what am I trying to model? The Rolling resistance. Rolling resistance. Okay, rolling yes. resistance. Yes, yeah. yes. So, so the rolling resistance is basically the sinkage and the force and the displacement of the soil during the sinkage. So the concept mm -hmm. is 
every time the tire turns, it's pulling itself out of a hole. So the rolling mm -hmm. resistance is essentially equivalent to the energy to compact the soil. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not. I'm not saying yeah, it's so true. I'm just saying believe it or not. <laughs> but, yeah. but that's how theoretical energy from soil compaction going to the tire is determined in this model. Mm -hmm. So uh, I see you said something about this normal pressure. It is kind of rectangular shape. And then if I understand correctly, when there's really resistance, basically the reaction force on the ground, on the terrain, will shift it forward a little bit instead of in the center of the rectangle. So uh, did you take that into consideration or what would you comment on that? Well, the what we actually looked at was the vertical stress due to uh, the tire straight down. Now, obviously, when the tire is moving, it's it's pushing the soil. Forward. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. So it's a rolling tire. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But but the resistance for the tire to move is, and, and you can look at that as, as a force times a distance to get to energy. So we take the resistance, which is normally a force. And then if you if it moves a certain amount or distance, then that force and resistance force and distance move is equivalent to the force propagated down into the soil and then the displacement of the soil. Mm, all right. Think okay. about that. Thanks. Yeah. And, uh, by the end of this presentation, would this slide be shared or the video since I missed it? So I'm really interested in this presentation. Yeah, I think it's on YouTube. I think they're going to put on YouTube. Uh -huh, great. Yeah. Thanks. And Jenna, is that right? That there will be a link posted on the ISTVS website, I assume, for the YouTube video. Yeah, I'll drop a link into the playlist for the whole series as well, right now for folks. Great, thank you. All right, we're back to George Mason's very specific questions on certain slides. So get yes. ready, Paul. Okay. <laughs> Slide 22. Does right. the equation work for negative displacement or slip? And in slide 20, slide 26, it, uh, similar question about the slide sliding and bulldozing due to neutral steer and resulting negative slip. Can you predict net and gross traction during negative slip for an individual tire? I think this is the bottom line. Okay. So when we're talking about negative slip, you're talking about skidding, I'm pretty sure. So we have positive slip, which is the spinning of the tire, but negative slip is basically a brake tire that's being drug, dragged down the soil, right? And so the concept there is that we have three soil conditions or tire conditions, if you will. One is a brake tire that's not turning, and this is simp simplistically. We have a brake tire that's not turning, basically being dragged through the soil. We have a free rolling tire that doesn't have any braking or any torque applied to it to, to, to make it drive. And then we also have the drive wheel, which is has the thatch the engine that has torque that, that's making it drive, that's driving it. So we have three different conditions of the tire that I think is going to produce different bulldozing effects. Uh, a, a brake tire is going to just pile up the soil. A, a drive tire is going to drag that soil underneath it. And so we threw some empirical factors in to include braking, which is the, the classic bulldozing, if you will, and then the free rolling and the drive tires, which essentially pull the, pull the soil under it and then compact the soil. So we don't have we we wanted to include that into the model, but we didn't really do a great theoretical job to say what kind of bulldozing applies to uh, braked, free rolling, and drive tires at different depths. Uh, more work to do, George. No, keep them busy. Yeah. Uh, he also mentions the neutral steer versus. Um the sliding, bulldozing. So is it a similar kind of concept? I guess you don't get a lot of slide bulldozing unless you're getting 
a, sli a lateral slide? I, I'm yes. not on quite the, sure how to phrase that question. Yeah, um, on the, and I don't see the question, but. Uh, um, let me read it specifically. Maybe that's clearer. Slide 26 right. is yes. the sliding bulldozing due to neutral steer and resulting negative slip, question mark. Let me take a look. Oh, there's, there's George. George. Right. Can you see me? Okay. Yeah. yeah, we see you. We hear you too. Oh, Go ahead. Great, great, great. Uh, I, th I think you answered my question. Uh, uh, <laughs> there's, there's some ongoing questions when you talk traction, like uh, what, what's happening at zero slip? Do you have traction? Do you have net and gross traction at zero slip? Uh, we've actually seen it in a DM model, but I think it's case dependent. Um, so, so yeah, th this, this, this is kind of an ongoing uh, series of questions that, uh, but you, uh, you, you asked the question correctly to begin with Sally. And I think you, yeah. you probably gave a good answer. You know, George, I think the DEM model could handle that question very well. Uh, at least develop some, you know, <laughs> empirical differences between the, the drive characteristics of the wheel and the resulting uh, bulldozing or traction force requirements. So, the problem, the problem with the DEM is it it requires, depending on what model you're using, it requires anywhere from five to seven empirical factors to, <laughs> to define the soil. So, so it was really interesting to see what soils equipment you took out in the field to take measurements, um, and and the fact you you still haven't translated into Becker constants and things like that. There's there's a lot of error in these transfer for functions when you go, but with cone index the for, for most part, the stress increases with depth, right? When you measure it, and, and with the Boussinet, the stress decreases with depth. Well, so the, that's, yeah. So they intersect. If you if you add the two together, I think you have a, a nice outline of where the optimum, uh, well, optimum the, the, shears are. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. The, so the stress increases with depth, depth, but that's not the stress distribution. That's the basically the force to push that cone into the ground. And you're adding confining pressures and all sorts of things onto it. So, yeah, the, the cone penetration resistance increases with depth. But that's a little bit different than the stress distribution from a surface load. Yes, but they're somewhat correlated, correlated, if you will. Mm -hmm. I, I think you could show a correlation between the two. That might be interesting. Maybe yeah. use, use the cone index to define the Boussinet stress distribution. Well, I think that's where the Froelich concentration factors come in, soft, medium, and hard soils. And so your, one of your questions was, what do we measure in the field? Well, we're always measuring cone penetration resistance because that's kind of the fundamental measurement uh, that has been used forever. Uh, we do use a drop cone because that's more of a surface uh, strength measurement, which was important to us with vegetation damage. And then we look at torsional shear, uh, usually close to the surface, Co uh, cohesion and friction angle uh, characteristics. So those are the the main ones that we, and of course soil moisture. So what what did you correlate to slippery condition from moisture content? Woo, George, George, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, I think you know we had I, Sally correct me. I think there's three conditions: slippery, normal, and something else. Dry. I think it, we use five, like the wetness conditions. I don't know. I think they were the five wetness indices that we used for that database, George. It was a Ethan Allen database was generated together with Tardic for the HTTM program. Hi. Yeah, and, and almost any answer would have been okay and wrong <laughs> and right. But, <laughs> but, but you know, I, we we I did something. I used anything above ninety percent on the first two centimeters as wet slippery. It depends on soil type. It, it is a wrong and right answer. <laughs> yes, yes, right. <laughs> Always. Yes, yes. But you're right. Um, I'm sorry. Um, Fascinating discussion. Very good, Paul. Thank, thank you. Very Hi. good. And I think we have Ray has another question. Ray Kruger. Hi. Before George Mason leaves, um, I would like to ask a question with all the experts on the field uh, about a point he brought up about the thrust at uh, zero slip. So I've also seen that um, basically my master's is on bevometer testing, but I plug the bevometer test values into classic Packer Wong model, and it generates this theoretical supermassive thrust at zero slip. 
Um, and George Mason said he also found that in the dem. So hmm. I would like to discuss like why is this happening? Um, yeah, if anybody have, has some input or have also observed that. Ray, I don't have a good answer for you, so uh, maybe somebody else uh, can can address that. So, so this is a, a DEM where you press the tire down into the D, the uh, particles, and you see a thrust. Or, or can you explain what you're seeing? Um, no, no, no. I just the standard backer Wong where you integrate the pressure underneath the wheel and the shear stresses underneath the wheel from pressure sinkage testing and pavimeter shear testing. Um, yeah, so George Mason brought up the point and then I hmm. just like confirmed that I also saw that. Okay. Um, yeah. D DM, will show, um, DM will show you that you have net traction and gross traction at zero slip. Which is which is interesting, and the one DM models we're running, um, and in the field and in the laboratory, we've seen some traction at zero slip and negative negative traction, negative <laughs> drawbar pull and net traction is negative, and positive gross traction at zero slip. But it, it's case dependent. It it's kind of depends on what vehicle you're testing, what soil conditions. Uh, how you're applying the torque, um, the drivetrain properties. It, this is, is so case dependent that um, it's, it's really uh, any answer would be correct or incorrect. Mm. So, so okay. it, it's, a, it's a tough one. Now, I haven't seen a good paper on zero slip. Um, the one that I was led to look at was, um, it was by free tag. It was a, it was a, discussion paper and he was showing he, he was showing um uh zero net traction and at zero slip but on that case he was referring to a uh, hard surface mm -hmm. and and so as you get into deformable surfaces the resistance against the forward movement of the tire creates a positive i think a positive gross traction and and but anyway, it, it's 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 relatively complex and and important if you're trying to calibrate your model. So so often you want to calibrate it around zero slip and the extremes, so you bound the problem or bound the equations. So it's it's an important question, but um, the answer is a little bit more complex. And I, I, I'm sorry, I'm not giving you a straight answer, but it's it is complex. George, I think that sounds great. And I, I, I think if you go back and look at the Wismer Luth models on tires and slippage and in the different uh, torques applied to the tire and the influence of cone index on soil resistance, you can kind of see, see exactly what you're describing there, but in a graphical format, that's a little bit easier to interpret. Uh, Wismer and Luth and Becker, I think Becker, Hanamoto, uh, most of these guys don't do negative slip. It's free tag, free tags numeric is all for positive slip. So as you get to zero slip, and particularly as you go negative, it goes to infinity. Um, there is some equations, a magic tire model, and a couple others that do um, both negative and positive slip. And those kind of give you an idea of what's going on at zero slip, but they can be modified. I think McLaurin modified it slightly. And, and but he's got it to where you can move it around at zero slip. Ray, send me an email and I'll I'll send you what I was talking about with Wismer and Luth and and maybe that can help explain some of the things. Because okay. I use it Thank when I used much. to teach a class. <laughs> but Thank you. Sure. And we also have uh we may Ma back. I'm yeah. I can't if you want to pronounce yeah. your name for us so you can say uh, it better next time. <laughs> uh, my name is Yue Wei Ma. So Yue Wei. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, I basically, I previously worked at Siemens. So um, pass, and then we use magic formula. That is called uh, uh, MF Swift and MF Tire, which is from Professor 
is at Pacheca, the Delft University, where I graduated. So, and for the magic, uh, magic tire and it's on the on-road tire, so it is for hard surface and um, probably it's not related, but uh, what I hear the question from Ray and he asked about, uh, he said something about when that's zero slip and then there was a big thrust. Is that correct, Ray? I think that's what, how that? George was, re was talking. Uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what I want to say that basically if you have zero slip and then when you have a camber angle and then also such slip angle and then that will affect these uh, forces and moments generated. So I'm not sure what you are talking about. Is that a zero slip condition? You still have zero camber and zero set slip angle. Everything is just, you know, just, 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 you know, free rolling and then still get large force or moment. But what I want to emphasize is that when you have a camber angle and then set slip angle, and then that will affect the distribution of the force and moments generated at the contact surface from the on-road perspective. It's not an off-road, but uh, that's what I learned. Yeah. Mm. yeah, there's a lot of scrubbing happening on a road surface that is a little different when you're on a deformable material. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's uh, pretty complicated. Um, Vladimir Vantovich, I think you have a question. I see your mic is free. Yeah. Hi. How are you doing all? Hey. Hi. Uh, very nice presentation. Thank you very much, Paul. And um, I just wanted to comment a little bit of what just a very great discussion on the zero slip conditions. What George uh, has been talking about this for a long while. And I believe this is a very important point. Um, I just want to add this, that a similar discussion was back to uh, Soviet Union in 1960s, 70s, and 80s. At what actually mode of uh, operation of a wheel you have a zero slippage? A lot, a lot of discussions, debates was over there. Uh, I provided many of those references to Professor Kutzbach in Germany. And I asked him to write a paper for the Journal of Thermomechanics, and he did. And this paper was published a year ago or so. Uh, probably this would can also contribute to our discussion on this topic. And uh, uh, I also want to mention that somewhere in 1950s, 1960s in Germany was done a lot of work, and uh, in particular, I can't recall the name of the researcher at this. I will find this somewhere in my records. But this German researcher, he analytically and experimentally proved that zero slippage occurs between driven and uh, free mode. Driven mode, it means zero torque. Free mode, you apply a torque to drive yourself with zero net force. So somewhere in between, you have this, what they call neutral mode. And zero slippage, it belongs to that mode. To that mode. So I, I used to have this dissertation back to Belarus. I don't have it anymore with me. But it was a very nice research done over there. And um, Alex Keen asked me to initiate all this discussion somewhere here on this uh, um, uh, lights. So probably it's a good probably would be a good discussion and uh, we need definitely to have it to make sure that uh, we definitely do the right things. Uh, for all my life, what I have done is I understand that I cannot solve, resolve this issue. I cannot solve this problem. But what I should do practically. So, and what we do usually, we, uh, we assume that the rolling radius on asphalt at zero torque corresponds to zero slippage on, on any soil. We just take this as the one zero you know, slippage condition and we count slippage from the zero on any soil. And it definitely brings some error, but uh, not very big. And if we have this error, it's, it's consistent. It's this zero everywhere. So this was one of the approaches what we did. 
Uh, but again, it's very important, and thank you very much for raising all these issues. I'm sorry for talking so long. Thank you very much. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Actually, Vladimir, can you um, post the reference to Kutzba's paper in the chat? Um, or which journal Terra Mechanics issue it was? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, give me a couple of minutes. When I, you are talking on this, I will find the number of the journal and post it here in the chat. Thank okay, you. thank you. I've actually done some really, you have to have really sensitive torque cells to measure that. And I've done that, some of that for low rolling resistance tires in, in winter. It was a pretty hard measurement to, to make. Um, but yeah, it's a complicated Uh, do we have any more questions? I see um, there's a lot of discussion in the chat, Paul, that you probably can't see because you're multitasking too many things. But uh, there's a lot good discussion about uh, follow-on NRMM or NG NRMM. And um, they're doing a demonstration in Germany in May and Ole Balling, Balling and uh, David Gorsuch uh, hopefully can give us an out brief on that, or maybe I, if they're gonna do some virtual seminars during that demonstration, that might be nice to partner with ISTVS for that. Did you hear that, Oli and Dr. Gorsuch? <laughs> so let reach out to us if you wanna do a, a just, yeah, great, good. Yeah. He says, yes, yeah. yeah, because this is a great forum for you know presenting some of that work. And if you're gonna present it virtually anyway, it'd be nice to have this group involved. Um, and anything else we have from the group that want to have a question? Any final comments from you, Paul? No, I, I appreciate all the input on that. And um, I think it was really good discussion. I know this is a topic that we, we've all been working on in many years, and we're all looking at it from different perspectives. Uh, but we're keeping our feet on the ground, and uh, we're trying to come up with the, the best best solution. So uh, it's nice that everybody is, uh, you know, moving forward with this. Um, it's nice to nice to see that and sharing their information, which is really nice. I know the uh, the uh, Terra Mechanics uh, ISTVS website resource page has a really good uh, description of NG NRMM, the different uh, models that were developed, uh, some some documents and the slideshows that were shown up at, uh, was it Kensaw? Uh, but uh, the, uh, the different presentations provided there and all the authors were very happy to uh, let those uh, slides uh, be presented. And uh, so I think we're good. Great, and we've had a great audience. I don't know if you caught all the names from all over the globe, Paul, but you oh. had a, maybe, maybe all continents. I didn't see anybody from Antarctica in there, but <laughs> maybe all other continents were, yes. were on the line. <laughs> Mohit, do you have some closing words? Uh, yes, so as we are coming to the closing, I just like to share something. So yeah, regarding what Dr. AS was saying, so we at ISTVS are trying to develop the ISTVS resource initiative, and we would like to get more graduate students involved. It is like an informational wiki, but more related to Terra Mechanics and all the related relative work that we do at ISTVS. Further, we are also, the ISTVS is going through a membership drive right now, and we request anyone who wants to get more involved with the society as well as any kind of activities that the society does to join the ISTVS using the links provided on the slide. So apart from that, I think Jenna also posted the link to the NRMM page on the resource initiative. If anyone would like to know more about it, they can go there. And I thank our speakers, uh, uh, speaker Dr. Ayers and Dr. Shub for hosting this event today. And thank you all for attending. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. And uh, Vladimir just posted the uh, journal term, term mechanics issue that has that zero slip discussion in it by Kutzba. So, Maybe Jenna can leave that online for a little while so people can grab that if they need it. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you. Bye.